Welcome to Lecture 7, Public Administration in the United Kingdom. Introduction. This lecture seeks to introduce you to public administration in the United Kingdom, otherwise known as Great Britain. The nature of public administration in the United Kingdom has been shaped largely by its unique development. Unlike other countries, it has developed public institutions that are peculiar to it. E.g., the parliament comprised of the House of Lords and House of Commons. The historical developments of the United Kingdom shape the way and manner its public institutions function. However, the need to meet the demands of its citizenry for efficient service delivery has led to attempt to modernize public institutions and it is this modernization drive as we will see shortly in this lecture that has been the most important factor explaining the way public institutions in the United Kingdom work today. Course Objectives after this lecture, you should be able to 1. Discuss the nature of British political system 2. Identify the major organs of public administration in the United Kingdom 3. Describe the workings of these institutions or organs and 4. Explain some recent development in British public administration. Historical environment for public administration. British political system is characterized by continuity and change. In many ways, the history of British has been marked by the love for the past. As you perhaps know, still standing firm today are political institutions that reflect British political history such as the British monarchy, the parliament, etc. In another sense, the United Kingdom is different from its past. The past of the monarchy has been successfully challenged by parliament, thus limiting the past of the monarchy. The revolution of 1688 was the most symbolic challenge to the monarchy and it represented attempt to establish a parliamentary government, the rule of law and the rights of rebellion against tyranny. According to Palmer, Colton and Kramer 2007. With the establishment of a new political order, as a result of the revolution, the basis for individual expression was created. Individuals with entrepreneurial instinct could produce goods and services to meet the needs of their communities. The growth of this kind of activities across the United Kingdom was a significant part of the Industrial Revolution. However, much of these activities was restricted to England. As the industrialization process accelerated or intensified, it produced far-reaching consequences. With the rising powers of the industrialists and traders, they became a valuable source of income for government, since governments had no important sources of revenue, except loans and taxes derived from their people. These aspects of development had tremendous implication for development of public administration in the United Kingdom for the following reasons. One. As industrialization deepened, governments could generate high income 
as standards of wealth and income increased. 2. Government expanded its services to meet the needs of its tax-paying populations. 3. Political and economic reforms were undertaken and this gradually conceded power to the people. As the industrialization process continued, Britain eventually became the most powerful economic power in the world. Although, by the end of the 19th century, its prominent status in the world became challenged by rising power like the United States and USSR. With its ascendance of global prominence, imperial expansion was undertaken and this led to the recruitment of more people into the public service to man territories in Africa, Asia and in other parts of the world. Although the need to avoid a large manpower in its colonies was emphasized in order to avoid animal strain on its resources. In the 20th century, however, under the weight of two world wars, Britain's economy became severely strained. The wisdom of the post World War II era was to embark on the development of a welfare economy. Indeed, as the economic historian Eric Opson has noted, the Second World War forced Britain into the most state-planned and state-managed economy ever introduced outside a frankly socialist country. This development was underlined by certain historical factors, of which the most crucial was the new Keynesian economics that is state's intervention in the economy, which rapidly infiltrated government through the massive recruitment of academic and other outsiders in the civil service. Like most governments, the British government undertook measures that provided generous un unemployment benefits, universal health schemes, educational assistance, and social aid programs aimed at the disadvantaged. This resulted in a steady increase in the size and scope of government at least until the 1970s and 80s. But the welfare system later became problematic for the following reasons. First, there was the problem of financing the welfare state. Secondly, the welfare program no longer generated broad-based political support. Thirdly, the economic and political theories that were used to justify the welfare state became unfashionable. Beginning from 1979, the welfare system was radically altered. The British Conservative Party leader, Margaret Thatcher, who became Prime Minister in 1979, led the campaign against the welfare state. The welfare state was attacked as costly, wasteful, paternalistic and bureaucratic. It was blamed for eroding individual initiative and responsibility according to Palmer, Colton, and Kramer. As a result of the recession of the 1970s, unemployment climbed. The pound sterling, the British currency, dropped and trade unions refused to accept measures posed by the Labour government. In response to this situation, 
the Cheta government decided to cut government expenditures, reduced imports, and restricted trade union wage demands. The focus shifted to investment, productivity, and economic growth. Though her policies were successful, as she succeeded in curtailing the powers of the unions, returned over one-third of the nationalized industries to private enterprise and made credit more available to business and home buyers. However, unemployment remained high. Fiscal retrenchment out education, especially the university. However, as economic development slowed down at the close of the 1980s, new fiscal measures were introduced that ultimately led to the fall of the charter's government. In 1997, the Labour Party came to power with an energetic young man as its leader. Under Blair, labor diverged remarkably from the traditional orientation of the Labour Party, introducing reforms that called to question its belief in core Labour Party values. Indeed, as Tony Blair has recounted in his memoir, A Journey, one of the things he set out to do as soon as he became Prime Minister was to reform the British public services and welfare state to be in consonant with the world of the first of the 21st century, according to Blair 2010. Upon emerging as Labour Party leader in 1994, Blair suggested the need to remove Clause 4 from the Labour Party Constitution. The clause committed the Labour Party to nationalization and state control and gave a clear picture of the kind of policies Blair will implement as leader. The removal of the clause gave the Blair government the opportunity to execute modernizing reforms that were more similar with the policies implemented under Tata that, than other labor governments. Political culture. From the historical overview already presented, we can discern the prevailing political orientation of the British people. 1. The coexistence of continuity and change. Britain is characterized by a love for its past, and although changes and modernization are taking place, its traditional institutions are adapting to the changes that are taking place. 2. Britain has been described as having a civic culture. The point was made by Gabriel Armand and Sidney Verber. 1963. In their book, Civic Culture, they argued that Britain was characterized by a civic culture marked by confidence in the governmental system, a liking for strong government, and a general respect for its political class and the policies it pursued. Although since the 1960 Britain has witnessed the rise in protest cultures and scenes of riot depicting dissatisfaction with the status quo, particularly by working class youths. The British have a culture that venerates tradition. The British political system is characterized by 1. An elite civil service. 2 absence of a written constitution, 3. An emasculated parliament, 
Four, a system of local government dominated by the center. And five, absence of converted system of administrative law to protect citizens from the states. Six, slow and half-hearted acceptance of the opt man principle. Three forces remained persistent in public institution in the United Kingdom. One, class. Two, gender. Three, race. Constitutional framework. Continuity in British culture is illustrated by its constitutional development. British constitution is unwritten because its provisions are not converted in a single document. These are five sources of the British constitution. 1. A number of ancient powers belonging to the monarch as royal prerogatives. These remains but are inherited by the prime minister. 2. Major statutes passed by parliament and a range of common law decisions passed by judges. 3. A range of conventions which regulate matters of central importance in the working of government including the operation of the cabinet itself. 4. Authoritative opinion of learned jurists many of which are landmark judgments from the past to be consulted in times of uncertainty or crisis. The British system is based on a fusion of powers and not a separation of power since the minister, ministers heading the departments are also leading members of parliament in the majority party in the legislature. The key constitutional doctrine of the sovereignty of the parliament denies the court any authority to veto legislation, as it often happens in Nigeria and the United States. The prime minister is constitutionally premier's enterprise, that is, first among equals, and commands a formidable array of political resources depending on his personality and may sometimes look very much like an executive president. Overview of the machinery of government In the United Kingdom executive powers are divided between the British crown and the Prime Minister. In practice, the monarch asks the leaders of the party with the majority in the House of Commons to form a government. The leader of the largest party typically nominates a cabinet of senior party legislators. Since members of cabinet are leading figures of majority party in parliament, they contribute to what Walter Bigot describes as the close union, the nearly complete fusion of the executive and legislative powers. There has historically been the forum in which the Prime Minister brought together leading members of the governing party to ensure agreement about major government policies, according to Rose. 2008. The parliament is divided into a house of commons and a house of lords. The prime minister comes from the party with the majority in the house of commons. The principal div division in parliament is between a party that has the majority in the parliament and the opposition party that forms a shadow cabinet. The British Parliament is sometimes regarded as one of the least effective in Europe. 
This is a result of single party majority government and a party system based on conflict between two main parties. This leaves the parliamentary opposition with very little influence on legislation. According to Gaga, Lever, and Mayor 2006, the parliament makes laws and scrutinizes the work of government. See the section on finance and accountability on more on how parliament scrutinizes government. Salient features of the public administration system and reform experience civil service the british civil service is often referred to as white Earl. it is the central government bureaucracy consisting of functional departments each headed by a secretary of state and ministerial team the evolution of the civil service in the uk has been marked by its historical development. In the early 19th century, there was no single public service in Britain. What existed was a scattered mix of offices. At that time, members were often the sons of the aristocracy, many of whom were to dull for sources in the church or the army and their roles were hardly different from that of the politicians that appointed them. Remuneration was often provided through bribes and gifts. However, the civil service needed to be reformed to meet the needs of commerce and enterprise of the 19th century burgesses. This rising commercial interest was evident in the Liberal Party and it was under a Liberal Party government that an inquiry was commissioned to draft a blueprint for modern service. The 1854 North Coast Trevor Report was greatly inspired by the Indian Civil Service. Amongst its recommendations were the following. 1. The department should be aggregated into a unified home civil service. 2. Officials will be career people, not political appointees. 3. The public service should be organized hierarchically from clerical routine through a range of executive tax to high attitude policy making and recruitment were to reflect these distinctions. 4. Recruitment will be based on merits as it indicated by competitive examinations conducted by an independent civil service commission. 5. Examination for the upper echelons will be geared to the syllabus of the few existing universities. With this reform, the public service grew steadily over the years. In 1900, membership stood at around 50,000, but two world wars and the bugging welfare state saw its peak at around 751,000 in 1956. However, with the new liberal policies of Margaret Thatcher beginning from 1979, the public service has undergone enormous deflation in its size so that by 1979 the workforce stood at around 476,000. The new political climate saw the increase in casualization of staff, the number rising from 11,100 in 1976 to 19,600 by 1997. Why the part-time workforce advanced from 31,100 
to 56,100 to compensate for the shrinkage of permanent staff, taking both permanent and casual staff into account. The total in 1997 was 495,000, a reduction since 1976 by 35%. Civil servants. The non industrial service broadly comprises three elements the administrative group, a category of specialist group containing professionals such as scientists, doctors, and lawyers, and a set of departmental classes employing experts in areas such as taxation. Although the reality is that civil servants in the United Kingdom work based on their general administrative and managerial skills and it is based on this that they are addressed. NSC has noted that the image and to some extent the reality in Britain is of a civil service staff at senior level by classic scholars from prestigious private secondary schools and universities. See NSC 1989, Gaga, Leva, Amelia 2006. However, there are separate career tracks for individuals such as statisticians, engineers, or scientists who are recruited on the basis of scientific technical expertise and for those who are recruited as generalist administrators or though those attempting to make the transition from specialist to more senior generalist still face many obstacles. The Fulton Committee on the civil service set up by a former prime minister, Aaron Wilson, sought to remove the demarcation between the generalist and the specialist in the civil service and to give more attractive promotion to specialists in the civil service. Still, in spite of attempts to open up recruitment into the civil service for women, the civil service still reflect on overwhelming male hegemony. The service has been inhospitable to women. There has also been a class factor since the civil service is pervaded by a margin. A margin is a high-ranking civil servant. The 1854 North Coast Travelian legacy earlier referred to as involved civil service with an enlist orientation. This is evident in its recruitment mainly from the public schools and the elite Oxford Cambridge universities. The civil servants, politics and neutrality. The North Coast's Trevelyan reforms established a convention of political neutrality. In the pursuit of a career in the civil service, civil servants are expected to serve government of all kinds to equal degrees. These issues led to debate between those who felt the civil service would become sympathetic with the force of establishment. In other words, there will be a gaze change. However, as some scholars have demonstrated, civil servants are self-interested enlargers of their budgets or bureaucratic interests. Since the administration of the Lord of the Labour Party leader, Aaron Wilson, who became Prime Minister in 1964, he feared that the civil service would not cooperate in a series of major policies change, changes 
he wished to implement. As a result, he appointed a number of people with well-known labor credentials to specially create positions as personal advisors. This was resented by career civil servants. The Tata government followed the Arad Wilson government and also appointed a personal advisors from outside the government system, fearing that public servants might not cooperate in the massive court of the public service she wished to implement. This trend continued under the Labour government. Political advisors continue to be very important players in the policy making process. The net result of this trend was a system in which the policy making role of the senior civil service is supplemented by a more polit politicized cadre of ministerial advisors. Other government agencies. Apart from the civil service, which is known as Whitehall in the UK, recent reforms have attempted to establish semi autonomous government agencies. This was a product of the 1988 efficiency report. Since an immediate implementation of the report was bound to create in fighting within the civil service and was fraught and was faced with severe opposition the report did not come into effect immediately when it eventually did the reform broke the single structure of the civil service into separate executive agencies each of which will carry out government policies with a broad framework set by the department. The agencies were to be managed by chief executives with a high degree of autonomy from the Treasury. By April 1997, over a hundred agencies employed 77% of all permanent public officials, leaving a central core in the main civil service of some 50,000 according to Kingdom 2000. Apart from the civil service and the semi-autonomous agencies, there is a range of quasi-autonomous non-government organizations that is hereafter referred to as Quangos. Unlike the executive agencies, Quangos are not government departments. They are established in areas where it is deemed necessary that some functions should be undertaken with some degree of autonomy from the policy process and operate in various areas of industrial, social, scientific, cultural, economic, and aristic life. They are usually funded from the National Treasury and are run by boards appointed by ministers. Regional and local governments Great Britain comprises of the nations of Scotland, Wales and England, while the United Kingdom is comprised of the countries that make up of Great Britain and also include Northern Ireland. These political entities were previously managed without dissatisfaction. Although in Northern Ireland, separatist sentiments were expressed before the policy of dev dev devolution was introduced. Although in Scotland and Wales, nationalist movements have been gathered momentum and this has led to English nationalism in England. Devolution 
devolution is the policy measure that has been instituted to cater for the growing demand for autonomy by the people of the nation mentioned above. By so doing, the central government in London has given some degree of autonomy to the delivery of public services in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The Scottish executive, for example, which is accountable to a permanent in Edinburgh, can legislate in area of affecting a large range of social and political and public services of direct concern to individuals and communities, such as education, health and roads. The Assembly in Wales has, ad has administrative discretion but not legislative or taxing powers, according to Rose 2008. The developments in each of these constitu constituent parts of the United Kingdom have been shaped by certain historic developments, which will not be mentioned here. Strong nationalism in Wales and Scotland, as well as Scatarian strife between nationalist and unionist communities in Northern Ireland has kept the issue of regional governance firmly on the agenda in the United Kingdom since the 1960s. In reaction to this nationalistic sentiment, several attempts were taken to define the status of Northern Ireland between 1979 and 1997. These attempts were initially unsuccessful upon assuming office in 1997. Blair announced referendums for the creation of regional parliament in Scotland and Wales. In the state of Scotland, the establishment of the regional parliament was to be accompanied by the creation of an executive that ascertained taxation powers. The election were held in 1997 and resulted in the establishment of Scottish Parliament and Welsh SNID. Scotland now has its own parliament with a first minister, a position that can be described as the Prime Minister of Scotland. The power devolved to Scotland are considerably more than those devo devolved to Wales. The Scottish Parliament has the right to change the rate of income tax levied in Scotland. It also has power over education, health, environment, economic development. It also has power over education, health, environment, economic development, local government, transport, sports and agriculture among others. Powers reserved to the British Parliament in Westminster include defence, foreign policy, large-scale economic management and the social security system. In Wales, there is no Welsh executive, no right to vary income tax. The fear function can be performed locally, leading to leading some to decry with Welsh snedit as no more than a taking shop, according to Ulls, House 2006. As part of the Northern Ireland peace process. The Good Friday Agreement of April 1998 had and consequent legislation created a new provincial assembly for Northern Ireland based in Belfast with substantial powers to be devolved to a Northern Ireland executive with a cabinet and a first deputy first minister consequent upon the successful implementation of all aspects of the agreement. Since the United Kingdom practices a unitary system of government, the implementation is that what 
has been decentralized can be recentralized and this has been more obvious in the case of Northern Ireland. Finance and Accountability Public expenditure has grown throughout the 20th century as a result of two world wars and the growth of welfare states according to Kingdom 2000. Principally, the source of revenue in the UK is through taxation, although this is supplemented by borrowing and income from government owned trading enterprises. Since November 1994, government has sponsored a national lottery to raise money for sports, the hats, and charities. In 1997, the Labour government began to use some of these funds to finance the National Health Scheme. The level and form of taxation are determined through the budgetary process. Constitutionally, government rights to tax must be approved by parliament when the Minister of Finance, known in the UK as the Chancellor of Ezequia, presents his spending and taxation proposal to the Commons on Budget Day. Since monies used must be properly accounted for, measures to ensure accountability have been created. The accountability process is done by the Public Accountant Committee. It has a membership of 15 specialist members of parliament and the chairmanship position is always taken up by the opposition party. The Public Accountant Committee is assisted by the Controller and Auditor General, a servant of Parliament with two tasks of releasing funds and auditing the departmental books. For purposes of accountability, the Parliament, through ministerial responsibility, has the power to call a minister to Parliament for any aspect of government conduct and may in cases of grief error by asked to resign. Although six members of the Prime Minister's cabinet are frontline members of parliament, they can capitalize on their membership to engage in debates, defend government bills during lengthy legislative process and take part in question time. The highlight of this process is the often grilling encounter with the Prime Minister for 30 minutes on Wednesdays, but this process is fraught with some loopholes, particularly bunk passing as Minister evade taking responsibility for issues under their noses, often referring the Parliament to heads of agencies. Recent development. Current reforms in the UK are geared at reducing government deficit through cuts in spending. These cuts have had enormous impact on public administration. The second stream of the reforms has been re has been directed at reforming and enhancing the role of the public sector in public services. The UK has a history of innovative public sector reform and the next round of reform proposed by the Prime Minister has enormous potentials. Following the lines of previous reforms, plans to open government contracts to small and medium enterprises rather than large corporations is sensible since it allows the country's largest employing sector access. Moreover, the current coalition government 
has placed the introduction of choice and competition at the heart of its program of public service reform. This has extended the work of the previous Labour government. This is against the backdrop of evidence from health and education, which have demonstrated that introducing competition and choice drives up quality and performance. The coalition agreement spoke explicitly, spoke explicitly of combining thinking on market, choice and competition with a belief in advancing democracy at a much more local level to generate a radical vision for public services. Summary Public administration has evolved over the years in the United Kingdom and has been shaped by the specific developments. We have so far focused on public administration in the United Kingdom. By way of introduction, we noted two forces have shaped the evolution of the political system in Britain and these are the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and Industrial Revolution. In terms of its political culture, Great Britain is characterized by references of its tradition, but it has also undertaken modernization efforts that are meant to bring its public institutions at soon with current day challenges. The definite events in the development of its public institution was the implementation of the North Coast Trevelyan Report of 1854, which was an ingenious attempt to transform its administrative system from one based to patronage from one based on patronage to one based on merit. Basically, the civil service orientation in the United Kingdom is based on a generalist orientation whereby officials are judged not by their competencies, its technical area, but in their general administrative competence. We also notice shifts towards the evolution of regional governments in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, largely in response to increasing demand for autonomy. Recent reforms have been geared towards reducing government def deficits and such measures have had their consequence for the operation of the civil service as more responsibilities have been created, have been contracted out to semi-autonomous non-governmental agencies in a bid to foster transparency and accountability in the delivery of public services. This is the end of lecture 7. Thank you for listening.